The Safavid dynasty was Shiite Muslims, bitter rivals to the Sunni Ottomans. According to the Shiites, a leader had to be designated by his predecessor and had to be of the family of Muhammad. According to the Sunni view, it was not designation that was necessary and a person could be a leader of the community without being a direct descendant of Muhammad. This challenge to legitimacy is the basis of the Shiite-Sunni split. A bitter division that still separates the Muslim world to this day. And I would say the Ottomans never really thought of themselves so much as Sunni until the Safavids came forth as this rival Shi. So the Safavids developed a rival ideology to the Ottomans, which then became an occasion for war over, of course, what wars are usually fought over. Wars are fought over land, over wealth, over territory, over prestige. And the Safavids waged a war of ideology in Eastern Anatolia, which was always for the Ottomans the most worrisome part. The terrain is difficult to conquer, difficult to control. The Safavid military was formidable, but there were cultural rivals to the Ottomans as well. They were great patrons of the arts. I think we know them more for their artistic patronage than of their great conquests and laws and systems and administration. I mean, when you look at Isfahan, it is the most beautiful city in the world, and that is the Safavid city, it's the Safavid capital. But it doesn't give you the same sense of power that the Ottoman uh, Empire had or the Ottoman capital had. It's a different sense of power. It's more eloquent, perhaps, more uh, precious in its decoration and its ceremonial spaces. It's a totally different aspect uh, of Islam. Safavi art and architecture is, is on a finer scale. It's known, it's known for its filigree. It's known for its intricate brushwork, you know. Uh, rather than for its stunning scale. In the soaring palaces of the Safavid Shahs, murderous intrigues against Suleiman and his dynasty were hatched that would reach into his very household. But Suleiman's eyes were on the west, where a fragmented and vulnerable Europe awaited his conquest. The Ottoman Empire encompassed everything from Egypt to Kurdistan, and he now had Hungary as well. But he had ambitions of going beyond that and actually bringing uh, the larger portions of the world known to him, if not all of it, uh, under his control. Suleiman's next step would be Vienna. Its conquest would drive a dagger into the heart of the European Habsburg Empire and open the way to the West. But as the heavily armed Ottomans set out for Vienna, the weather turned against them. The heavy cannon that had swept the Ottomans to victory after victory bogged down in the mud. Suleiman had to move on without them. With only light artillery, the Ottomans relentlessly shelled the city. But the smallest breach was ferociously defended. After a lengthy siege, with winter fast approaching, Suleiman withdrew his forces. He was not concerned. He was sure he would return soon enough. He never did. Suleiman's failure to take Vienna was pivotal for Europe. It was the first major defeat after a long time. Uh, the Europeans had been losing and losing and losing. And this was the dawn of a new day for Europe. 
But Suleiman had little to fear from Europe. Rival Muslim Safavids and his own family would bring the cruelest of sorrows to the Sultan, and ultimately to his empire as well. Suleiman, in some ways, serves as a sort of epitome of the 16th century idea of the wise and just ruler who was at the same time a very tragic figure. In the power-laden world of the Sultan's household, the intrigues never ceased. The Topkapi Palace, as it was originally conceived, had no quarters for the ladies. The women lived in what was called the Old Palace. But Hiram always complained about her husband, as most wives would, uh, spending too many days and months campaigning outside the capital. She kept saying she feels very lonely and the children miss him. Well, surprisingly, there was a fire in the old palace, fire in Hiram's quarters. So she had to be moved to the Topkapi Palace temporarily while her old quarters were being renovated. Well, she moved in and never moved out. Now Hiram was at the center of power promoting her own son as heir apparent and immersing herself in a web of deadly gossip and suspicion. She was incredibly devoted to her husband and any threat to Suleiman was a threat to her and she had to get rid of it. The first uh, threat came from Ibrahim Pasha who assumed titles that were only given to sultans. So Hiram knew something was going to happen eventually. And uh, to protect the empire and the dynasty, Ibrahim Pasha had to go. On March 15th, 1536, Suleiman and Ibrahim Pasha dined together, as was their custom. In the morning, Ibrim's body was found strangled. But Suleiman's desolation and loss had only begun. <laughs> 